God is good, and with each day that passes brings us a day closer to the launch of Defend the Night, upcoming MMO dark fantasy RPG that I've been very excited about, and I know some of the developers, and I'm just a big fan, and I'm going to be in the close testing, it looks like, very soon with the developers, and of course I'll be sharing that journey and adventure with you guys very soon, can't wait to get to that point. But, what I want to talk about today, first of all, these screenshots that I'm showing right now, are actually, I'm very happy to tell you, never been seen before by anyone besides the developers themselves. They gave me this information, uh, these screenshots specifically, so I could talk about their new updates and everything going on, and man, do they look good. I mean, it really blew me away, the quality that they're going for in this game. Now, I have a little bit of video splashed in here as well. Some of it's a little old, etc. You know, the game's still in development, keep that in mind. But it's coming along great. And today, I want to talk about the updates, right? Things that have been happening here in the first, uh, almost pretty much half of the year of 2020 as they're hard at development on this game. First of all, I want to talk about Seditious Sanctum. So, it's a place that... Uh, I believe I'll be experiencing very soon. This is a dungeon, and it's public, and it's intricate, right? We're talking traps. We're talking invisible walls with secret passageways. We're talking spending a ton of time in this dungeon. And let's talk a little bit about what they've said about it. The Seditious Sanctum is carved into a northern mountain pass in Skimmer's Cove. It was originally founded by one known as the Earl. This Sanctum is built around a legendary swamp that provides powerful toxins to the Earl and all those that vowed to protect him, known as the Black Serpent. So, Seditious Sanctum is a very dark, very cavernous place, has twisting tunnels, massive rock sprawls, there's a danger and risk around every corner. And we're going to get back to this dungeon here in a little bit further into the video, because the man behind actually designing this dungeon and its layout and everything, his name is Pi, and I, if you want to, I actually did an interview where Pi was part of that and talked a lot about his dungeon design and philosophies, and they're excellent. If you're, if you're a fan of old school MMO dungeon designs such as EverQuest, etc., then this is going to truly be something for you. Final Fantasy XI fans, I know it had some really cool deep dungeon dives. Still very different than EverQuest kind of feel in a lot of ways, but still like going down and getting lost in them and spending absurd amount of times exploring. That kind of feeling is really what you're going to get out of this game when this is launched. And soon, I'll have some video footage of delving down into this dungeon and some of the really cool stuff there and all that kind of thing. Now, real quick, right from the newest newsletter, I'm going to read you a little bit of lore about Seditious Sanctum, okay, just so you kind of get a feel for what this place is. I'm going to read it. Basically, here's how it goes. The boy lay in the shelter of great pillars of the stone entrance. Beyond, the bodies of his friends were strewn in various areas of the largest cavern he'd ever seen. Tears streaked across his face as he relived the visions and his flight to find an exit. He had tried to help, but to no avail. A large shadow covered what light of day was left, and he looked up to see a bearded man with large, hulking shoulders over him. He willed himself to be taken into the landscape about him, but instead, he heard a gentle voice speak to him. Are ye alright, lad? Here, take some of this, and let's make sure you're okay. After a long drought of liquid life, he looked at the man. My thanks. Who are you, my lord? The figure gathered himself, pulling away the flask and answered, offering his hand to help the boy rise. Versatera, son. And you? I go by Fonalil, so I was named. Thank you for the drink. I do feel much better, although I fear my friends might no longer say the same. And he dropped his head to his chest. They were trapped inside. Do you know the name of this place? The boy nodded his head. And yet you ventured inside. A group of mere boys? There put his arm about John Alisle's shoulders and took in a deep breath. Come, let us see if we might find your friends. But, sir! It's alright, we will be fine. Trust and we will do what we must. Seditious Sanctum, one of the most deadly places in Sertoga for young ones. The bones of many a wanderer have been found there by other unsuspecting travelers and explorers. The caverns have been carved into a northern mountain pass in Skimmer's Cove and found by humans who chose to follow the darker path. One of those, who just happened to be the founder of this cavern, went by the name of Lecton Banor, or the Earl as he was known. It was a shelter for those who spoke against the pious and actually encouraged others to speak and act against the civility that they encouraged, mainly pirates. Bandits of all types, otherwise the Earl's army called the Black Serpents. 
I thought that was pretty cool. If you want to hear the rest of the story, because there is more, obviously, check out the newsletter. I actually do, will have a link directly to that newsletter in the description down below. Now, next up in the newsletter, they go over Pi, who I was talking about earlier, who is Brad Bartram. And this guy is a level designer. He's designed these dungeons and things. So, let's, let's talk a little bit about this guy, right? So, first question was, what is your background? You know, what prompted you to become a dungeon designer? And he says he got into PC gaming in the 90s because of his uncle. He fell in love with the ability to manipulate items with the mouse. And he felt like PC games really stood out big time versus console games back then. And he started getting immersed in games like Might and Magic. And he immediately started thinking about dungeon designs and creative puzzles and all that kind of thing. And he always knew from that point on after he, you know, really dived in and started playing some games like that, some deep RPGs, that he had a knack and he wanted to design, do levels and dungeons and that kind of thing. He did do some Neverwinter mods back in 2008 and he felt it was really well received by the community and that's when he realized he really did have it in him and he wanted to do it. He also of course played EverQuest for 11 years. He ended up meeting up with the guys from Ninja Loot Games because of the Pantheon community and he was able to show off his skills and his design ideas and they loved it and here he is designing these cool dungeons which once again I can't wait to show you guys how cool they really are. So basically this guy has self-taught himself using Unity and learning and and, you know, just figuring things out. And then he created his first masterpiece, which is Seditious Sanctum. Which, by the way, is a dungeon designed for levels 5 through 14. So it's something very interesting about Defend the Night is that they're, they're, they want you hooked quick. They're going to hook you while you're young, okay? So level 5, you already going to be diving into the first dungeon, if you so choose, which is Seditious Sanctum. And, uh, you know, grouping and learning your role and going deep into this dungeon. And I love that. I think that waiting too long for a dungeon is a mistake. The quicker you can get people hooked and sink your claws into them about how cool your game design is and how fun it is to group with others, I think the better. So I'm really glad to hear that this dungeon we can enter at level 5. That means very quickly, like, get your bearings on your character, 1, 2, 3, 4, get to level 5, let's go out, let's start testing our skills with other people and all that kind of thing and get that socialization going immediately. And I love it, I love, love, love it. Now, here's a good question they asked him, which they said, can you explain situational gameplay for us? So he says, situational gameplay is a condition that exists where there tends to be more randomness than predictability. So dynamic is another term that means always changing or evolving and could also describe what I mean. I use this term a lot as something we should strive for in design because it certainly lessens the boredom and creates a lot more attentiveness while playing. Good examples of what helps with situational gameplay are wandering NPCs that break up static locations or NPC artificial intelligence that creates different fights or mechanics even though it may be the same type of NPC. Lastly, situational gameplay often falls strictly in the design of, of the abilities classes can use to properly control dynamic situation that occurs in your group members with individual thinking also contribute to unpredictable responses you may have to do in order to control or save a situation. I think that's a perfect example of what we need in the genre, right? We need a little unpredictability, yes, in the NPCs, but also the group dynamic. Who's in your group? What skills do they bring and how does that change the obstacles that you've actually already done before, but now you need to approach them differently, and that's through the actual abilities that classes can do. And I agree with that. That's how you do it, right? As a developer, that's what they should be focused on is those two things the artificial intelligence you know the npcs what happens there and the actual identity of the classes because that's going to change everything on how you play now here's another really interesting question right and it was how does this game differ in your opinion from others out there or even those in development his answer was no rails no handhelding, no question marks above persistent NPCs to follow around like moths to a light. So we are producing something that will feel alive and cause the players to think as they approach a situation. Not being able to smash through it blindly like other MMOs, our dungeons are what set us apart for sure. Our dungeons are huge inner worlds open directionally, meaning you don't enter at A, then go to B, then C, etc. in a linear fashion. 
When you enter, you can go in many different directions, which will be full of danger and discovery. You will get lost in some of them, and that is okay. It is by design and helps create that fear of not knowing. We anticipate it will take players weeks to figure them out, maybe much longer to master. With this in mind, the player will be able to reap great rewards for sacrificing this time and experience within them. So they also asked, is there anyone you consider as your biggest influence in the work you do? Do you have a muse? And he said, I am currently playing through EverQuest again on the Mangler server. EverQuest is by far my biggest influence as they did so much right. I give a lot of credit to Brad McQuaid and would say he is the guy. You can feel early on what kind of game they wanted to create and they pulled it off wonderfully. Is it perfect? Certainly not. But they did get a ton right. And here's another thing. So they talked a little bit about different games. He's played different MMOs, etc. And they asked him, if he takes away any good ideas from some of the other games, maybe something that really stands out and that they'd like to, he'd like to incorporate. And he says that players will take the absolute shortcut anytime you allow them to. No matter what it is, they will make it a speed game. It is unfortunate, but it happens every time. An example would be you allow them to reach max level in a few weeks and they literally bypass 60% of the game along the way. Bad design. We have to create a game that's so involving, so horizontally challenging and meaningful, that the race to the top for max level will actually hurt you. We want players to see every aspect of what we are building and why. We have to be careful to not allow anyone to want to bypass something because max level is their blinding goal. Slow and meaningful. Enjoy the world around you and have a good time with your friends within challenging content. Tough to do, but we are certainly trying hard to accomplish this. And then they ask, what is the one thing you'd love to tell everyone about this new world that you've kept to yourself so far? And he says, one of the toughest mechanics to build into any game is the death penalty. It needs to be harsh enough, but not too harsh, where a player feels like they are losing real time invested. Also, it cannot deter a player from taking risk out in the world. It would be a shame to design something that actually limits the actions of the player because they do not want to lose experience that is so hard to gain. Sounds impossible to balance between those two factors, doesn't it? Well, we feel we came up with a great solution to both. Now, let's move on. Let's talk, I want to talk a little bit now about the actual patch pad, right? Let's talk about the things that they've been working on. The class update for the cleric, which is their third overall class, and first Tiller class that they worked on is the Cleric. So they implemented an initial kit for the Cleric in February and March, including 13 new spells, new combat stances, and animations, and many updates to the buff and healing system. They also brought the Cleric into a couple of internal multiplayer testing sessions, and the addition of more spells, abilities, a combo system, and more on deck. For player updates, said they couldn't let their NPCs get all the love, so their player characters have also received overhauls in their controllers. This includes new combat stances by weapon loadout, animations, particles, sound effects, tab targeting improvements, and much more. In addition, the Shadow Knight and the Wizard classes have both had their spell effects updated to take advantage of the transition to the Unity HD render pipeline. As far as the optimization, the performance is a constant focus for the team throughout the development cycle, and they've recently taken some time to focus on some custom optimization techniques, adding an average of roughly 15 frames per second to their very large zones, like the aforementioned Seditious Sanctum, which is huge. 15 frames per second upgrade is gargantuan. So their goal is to take advantage of the latest and greatest that the engine Unity has to offer. As such, they've opted to beta test and go all in with Unity's high definition render pipeline, which is great news, which has dramatically increased their aesthetic ceiling. And, you know, they'll continue to learn, optimize their game using this new technology as they pursue a more gritty, realistic graphic style for Defend the Night. And this graphic style, as you can see, what they're doing here is hard to pull off correctly, and man, they're doing it. You know, that dark, gritty, dark fantasy world, right? And not to say, by the way, this won't have beautiful rolling forests and, you know, all the other things that come with the fantasy game. It will, but as you can see, the theme, the overall theme, of course, is this kind of feel, man. It's really hard to pull that off, especially as an indie developer, and huge, huge props to them for what we're seeing so far. It's looking great. So as far as NPC updates, they continue to regularly add new NPC models and animations throughout the first half of the year. The next step for their NPCs was a total revamped character controller, which we talked about earlier. Now, this includes major AI updates, such as variable spells and abilities, pathfinding, patrolling, and dispositions. What were previously fairly simple tank and spank encounters before are now challenging battles that even in the early stages require some adaptation and situational awareness from the player. 
with a base AI template now in place, this system will continue to grow as they add more ability options, more variation, and even a bit of randomness to their NPC's behavior. Now, loot and character progression. During the first half of the year, they implemented major updates to the loot, character persistence, and progression systems. So the designers now have the flexibility to deploy both defined and random world loot tables and their need greed pass. Rolling systems have been refined through internal testing. Character persistence and progression have also played a major role in recent tests as, our ba as their ba back-end functionality has proven that the basic game loop is now achievable for their test characters. Items, experience, abilities, and location now are all persistent for their initial alpha testing. That is the updates, guys, for Defend the Night. So far, moving along very well. Big, big difference from where the game was last time I talked about it when I introduced it at least to this channel compared to now. So making strides, very great work over at Ninja Loot Games. Love you guys. Please keep it coming. Get me in the game soon so I can show it off and get people hyped because they're... I, the thing is, guys, they don't want to rush me into the game too quickly because they, you know, they they don't they want it to look good. They want something to really show for me to really come back to you guys and tell you about, right? So they're they got to be getting close now, though, right? They've got NPC behaviors, uh, you know, so we're not just gonna be running through and spanking everything in the in the dungeon and easy, you know, killing the boss, no issues. You know, we're going. There has to be that difficulty, right? So as the AI has been vamped and all that kind of thing, we we got to be getting close to them getting me in there and. And it is actually confirmed that I will be in the next testing phase that they do as a group, the developers. So it should be pretty soon that I'll be in there. Uh, I would say, I, well, I don't want to give a date, right? Because I don't know. You never know what's going to happen. But soon. And I uh, can't wait to show that to you guys. Be looking forward and be, keep your eyes peeled for that video coming in the future. And of course, if you're new here to the Nathan Napalm channel, guys, please don't forget to subscribe, like the video, throw a comment. What do you think about these updates from Defend the Night? Have you already heard of it? You already following it? Are you this your first time hearing about it? And also, of course, please go to www.defendthenightgame.com, which I'll have a link in the description down below for easier access. And Check it out. Support these guys because they're really building something really special here. I love these screenshots, man. I just have to say that that fog in the graveyard, just literally as a person who wants to play a paladin and kill lots of undead, that absolutely makes my mouth just water down my chin onto my shirt and I have to change my shirt because it's got drool on it. I love it. I think this is fantastic. Keep going, guys. I love you guys. Love you, Defend the Night team. Everybody, let me know what you think about these updates down below, what you think about the game, this update, and all that kind of thing. And until next time, guys, God bless, and happy gaming. Please listen to what I say. I've been making videos all day. My friends all say I'm It's a video buffet. You can even hit replay. But please just subscribe I can't even describe Being part of my tribe I'll even offer you a fry But just please just subscribe And hit the bell notification too